lovely ladies would um, introduce yourselves and tell me if tell us if you are a performer playwright or a playwright performer. <laughs> I am a playwright performer. I'm a book writer, lyricist performer. And my name is Lori Flanagan Heggie, and I'm the Twin Cities rep for the Dramatist Guild. Uh, my name is Charlene Woodard, and I'm an actress, playwright. <laughs> um, I, my name is Lisa Crone, and uh, I'm really a uh, designation is uh, malleable for whoever wants to hire me, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> It's a great answer. Um, no problem at all. Um, can I just ask who in this room, everybody, who started out as an actor and then moved into playwriting? Wow. Wow. So, um, Lori, why do you think that tends to be the norm rather than the other way around? Well, I mean, speaking from my own experience and other performers I know that have moved into, into writing, it seems like a natural evolution of, of working as a performer. Mm -hmm. And I think some of it stems from a frustration about material or a, a need to do material, material that you want, you want to do. And I think some of it is just a natural evolution of kind of having control or interest in um, working in a collaborative way. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I bet a lot of people here were part of companies where that kind of creative work was happening as a performer, and so you naturally start to instigate it with your performance ensemble or the people that you're working with, and it doesn't even seem like a decision as much as just a, an evolution of the kind of work you're doing as a human being. Mm -hmm. so. Yes. For me, when I was in New York City working as an actor, I worked on a lot of original plays, so original work, so when you work with, you know, creating every day with a team of people in the cast, you sort of feel like you, you uh, that's normally, that's your norm, that's what you do. Um, so when the opportunity came to write, I felt like, well, I'm just going to try this because, I, you know, I had already added so many of my characters to people's shows and things and created things on my feet like that, so. Great. Lisa? Well, I had a similar um, experience I wasn't a writer. I, I mean, I told stories on my feet, funny stories. Uh, but I, I, I would have told you it was more likely I would be a brain surgeon than I would be a writer. I had no uh, particular interest in it. Uh, I had no reason to believe I had any ability to do it. And um, But I was working with a, a collaborative theater company, and we wrote together. And um, there were other writers in the company who were I mean, they were writers, and I wasn't a writer. Um, but I think I became, as I worked and created work, and then was also putting together these shows uh, of anecdotal stories, over time I became interested in uh, building, I mean, I think in retrospect what I wanted to do is make theater out of those stories. Uh, I wanted to figure out how to give them dramatic action, and I wanted to, um, uh, give them, <laughs> um, and then, uh, you know, have resonance, um, <laughs> and um, depth, and um, then magically it just happened. You want uh, to be Yeah, heard. so that's, so, so I started to, uh, painstakingly started to write uh, in order to achieve those goals. Mm -hmm. And now, Lisa, how does, how does one inform the other? How do they inform each other at performing and writing for you? Well, I think I, I mean, I, I really, you know, it's relatively late that I have written work that I haven't been in, and I really like doing that. I feel like I can, you can see <laughs> what's happening uh, when you're not in it, and switching back and forth, you know, the brains are very different between those two things. I mean, when I was working on my play well at Sundance, uh, you know, when you go to the Sundance Theater Lab, you have one day of writing, one day of rehearsing, so I would, you know, spend a day turning out new pages, and then we'd sit down to work, and We'd read the new pages, and I'd be like, "Oh God, who wrote this shit? I can't do that," you know. Uh, and Lee Silverman, uh, my director, would say, "You have to," you know. I'd be like, "I just have to go rewrite this before I can possibly utter those words." And she would say, "No, no, you you have to rehearse what you wrote," and um, that was really helpful because they're really different 
they're really different brains. And the kind of, um, you know, when you're an actor, and it was a real transition for me going from when my plays were just me to when, with Well, I had other characters in it, to stop trying to perform everybody's parts <laughs> psychically and make them say the lines the way I wanted them to say them, uh, which was serving no one's interests, um, it particularly not serving my own interests. So, um, you know, when you're a writer, you're thinking about the whole, and even if it's your own work, when you're performing it, you can't, it's, you can't do that. Um, you have to let the play do what the play does and let the writing do what the writing does. And I suppose that one of the benefits is that you can see both of those things. I mean, I know if, when I act in other people's work now, um, I don't need for my part to be the whole play. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think I know, you know, when, we see, when I've seen work by the Five Lesbian Brothers that um, is performed by other companies, there are these lines that go by that, um, you know, and, and the actors give them great subtext and it's like, oh, you know, that line was really just to, to link those two other things and so that person should do their costume change, so probably you should just say it and move on. <laughs> so those are, going back and forth, those are the kinds of things that you figure out, I guess. But it is a good practice to mouth other people's lines as they're saying them to you, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that it, it's true, it's true. Well, I, I, I worked with Arthur Miller on The Crucible, and when we were doing the read-through around the table for the film, he was like this. <laughs> <laughs> he knew everybody's line. He had written that screenplay, and he was saying them. <laughs> so, <laughs> Shirley, what, um, what feeds your soul better, writing or acting, or do they feed you in different ways? Well, the whole, um, I'm an actor. And I write because I wanted something that meant something to me, you know? And I felt like I'd been in the service of all these other playwrights all my life. And when I got the opportunity to write, to, to create something, I just felt like I want to use every chop I've developed. I want to play with no rules and, and take risks and have fun. And, uh, and 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 with 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 and be limitless. So and what I love about being on stage with your own work, your own movie going in your head, is um, and you and you stick to the lines every night, just like every every professional actor does. And all the blocking is all the same. But every night it's so brand new and so exciting. So they for me with solo acting. It's all one. Hmm. It's all one. Um, the the business of writing it, even for me, I write it on my feet. Mm -hmm. I I just I'm on my feet. I'm telling the story. I'm seeing it all. You you know I'm writing it on my feet. And then after I have been telling that story or on my feet for a year, the last thing I do is write it down. As a matter of fact, when I first started doing these plays, I didn't know how to type. <laughs> I didn't know how to, you know, so I would write everything on, on a legal pad and have just, and I still do, because that's how my, my thoughts flow. When it's time to write it down, then I have to do it on a legal pad and let them flow. I couldn't even call myself an actor, I mean a writer, until a few years ago, because I really felt like I was a, just an actor sharing her stories with the audience, using the audience as, um, as uh, my scene partner, and uh, just coming out and, and sharing. And have you used all of your chops yet, or do you still have tons more to use? What, I, what, I, what I'm all, now I'll tell you, I'm always in class, I still, still take class mm -hmm. all, twice a week, sensory and scene study, and um, I'm always spinning, and I'm always working to uh, in, in improve my craft. I'm always, because this is all I've got. I, I, I don't really count on my intelligence and all that. I count on my imagination, and I count on my body, my instrument. So, um, yeah, there's, for me, it's, there's no difference. It's all one. And that's why I love it. I didn't know that in the beginning. I didn't know that's what it would be. That was an exploration. That was a journey that I had to take. 
Laurie, how do you acting and, and writing compare in terms of preparation and time consumption and level of stress for you? <laughs> well, if my husband were here, um, <laughs> when I'm writing, it's stressful for everybody. <laughs> and when I'm performing, it's stressful for me. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, I'm kind of like, when John Logan talked yesterday about he gets up every morning at 4 o'clock and he has this schedule, I'm, I really envy people who work that way. I'm a writer who writes to deadlines, mm -hmm. and um, I know I'm not the only one, so I won't go into a shame spiral about that, but I will say <laughs> that that really is how I do my work the most productively. But because of that, it, it kind of puts me in a place, I'm, I'm sure there's other parents in the room, and I have a 10-year-old, and it kind of puts me in a place where I'm saying, you, you got to let me get this done. Like, I have this workshop coming up. You've got to let me get this done. Or I'm at a deadline, and, and she's starting to reflect that language. She'll reflect that language back to me about, Mom, you have so many deadlines, and you're... I, I, maybe you should take less projects. I, maybe you should consider saying no before you say yes to the next one. And there's, it's kind of true, because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm also a person who will track consecutive things, and that's why the deadlines are the things that kind of... I can't be the only person in the room right, like that, right? There are others among you. It's, but it's treacherous. And then, you know, for me, I'm, I'm a performer who's, I write all the time. I'm all the time working on something, but I'm not acting all the time. I don't go from acting project to acting project. Right. I live in a city that I came to 12 years ago, and it's full of performers like me, amazing women. And so when I get an acting gig, and I'm, 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 it's like ice cream because there's so many people who are fabulous that that are in my pool. And um, but I always overestimate my ability to write while I'm performing, and uh, and so that's just kind of a different kind of stress because I think okay, I'll be in rehearsal, and then while this is happening, I'll I'll be able to finish this when I'm tracking my timeline of how much work time I have for myself. I'm, I'm never able to fulfill what I think I'm able to fulfill while I'm performing. I've just, it's a flaw in my personality that I underestimate my ability to do both at the same time. So, um, and that's not to say you don't continue working when you're not physically working, but it's just, it's like th the balance thing is a big question for me and it's something I'm always working on and. It feels like a different part of my head. It yes. feels like a different part of me. If I'm studying lines, I, I can't bring myself to write something, I don't know why. It's like there's interference, or I think I think there is. It's, is is that the case for you? Well, you write on your feet, so oh, not anymore. Think, yeah. No. Um, which which am I? What am I? Um, so if when when I'm sitting down to write, I feel like sometimes I'm writing into a void unless it's a commission. Um, whereas, if I'm hired as an actor, I know I'm getting paid. Um, was there, is, was there a time when you you had that going on when you were I don't I don't know if I uh, I mean I, I find it I guess it depends on the part but it you know it's different being a generative artist and being an interpretive artist yes right. and I'm uh, you know I'm not um, you know I think I'm a good performer and there's some things that I do quite well but I'm not a great actor you know so I don't have that level of craft mm -hmm. um, so so I don't know if you know my experience would be um, true of other people but um, the, the the generation of work is is really difficult I mean I it's difficult for me I'm not a natural writer and I think um, you know we as you were as you were talking Lori I was thinking that we do have this feeling uh, I mean it's also like I, I was just meeting with them. Um, I'm, I'm uh, teaching at uh, NYU. I taught last semester. I'm going to teach next year. And Lucas Nath, who's a wonderful playwright and also an incredible teacher, um, sort of gathered the people who are teaching there to talk about the uh, pedagogy of playwriting. And uh, it was uh, me and uh, Chris Diaz uh, at this last meeting and Annie Baker. And we were uh, talking about how you teach playwriting. and sort of what we came up against um, was this, uh, I mean, I, I actually do believe that there are great ways to teach playwriting, and I think that uh, Lucas is gonna help me to figure out some better ones than I've had, but, um, but there is this 
thing, which is, you know, the, f the first year that I didn't, I, because I didn't study playwriting, I didn't really have a method for it, you know, I would just sort of hurl myself at it and then hit the wall and then slide down the wall and then crawl back up and do that a lot of times. And I feel like I became a writer when, um, when you were talking about when you called yourself a writer and it was the moment when I realized that this horrible feeling that I felt when I was writing was what it feels like to write. Mm -hmm. I kept thinking that was gonna go away. And then I realized, no, that's what it feels like to write. And um, uh, so, but that, you know, when I first taught at Yale, I was like, you know, after the first year, I was like, oh, I really figured out a lot of things, you know? And, and so next time I sit down to write my play, I can use those things, which I, and I sat down, I was like, oh, forget it. That doesn't help you. You know, you're always trying to invent the world. And so I do think that we, and I, I'm guilty of this as well, but we always feel like, and particularly with the people who are like, oh, I get up at four every day and I write and have a schedule. I just, I just want to, that, that just irritates me. I mean, I'm sure that's a good thing to do, but, um, but, I, um, but I, I do think that we feel, uh, also because we live in the society that has this kind of work ethic and this, you know, this sort of commodified world where we're supposed to have all these secrets to productivity and organization, but there is no structure to writing. There, there is no, um, you know, we, we walk into the wilderness and we claw our way through it and we make a mess and then we create that thing and then little by little we use our craft to shape it and hopefully make something good and maybe we'll make something good and maybe we won't. And the fact is that none of us ever know, truly, none of us ever know. There's not a great artist that you admire who you can't look at their career and see a hideous, humiliating failure. I mean, it's just part of the game. And so we, we want to, we feel like we should be able to go at it in an organized, sane way. But it is not an organized, sane pursuit. <laughs> no. So do you, do you have rituals around writing or, or around playwriting? All three of you, do you, what are your rituals around playwriting and, or writing and acting? Do you have them? For, for me, um, I find myself doing everything at night for writing because like, I have auditions and I have to prepare for auditions. I, 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 make, I like to do this TV and film thing so that I can then take time off and do my plays and, and, um, and other people's plays. I love to do other people's plays, but I have auditions um, added to things that really can really wreck the week because you have to learn these lines and then you have a, and then put yourself on tape and you have to do all that stuff. And, and that was supposed to be a day you thought you were going to write. And so for two days you're trying to get this job for two or three days. And then, okay, didn't get the job, now you have to get back to your work. And so I find myself sort of, you know, writing on the, on the go. Just writing, I've written all these, I've written these plays in my spare time. It feels like because I don't. There are things that come in. The the making of a living comes in there and ruins any routine that I might have. Wow, Lord. I I I don't think I have a ritual really. Yeah. Um, but again, that's my flaw, you know. But uh, <laughs> I mean, when I say a deadline, I mean I I I, well, I collaborate. I almost strictly collaborate. That's m mostly how my process goes, and so. One of my favorite things about that is that you're in relationship with other people. Mm -hmm. And so with each project, we kind of come into our own ritual and our own agreement about how that's going to go. So it's kind of dependent on um, where we are in the process and I in terms of whether it's the back and forth moment or I'll, I'll do a lot of, I'll spend a lot of time um, in normal daylight hours in relationship with my other and then a lot of time in my cave on my own. So until I come back out with stuff that we have to go back and forth on. So I don't know if that. Lisa? I don't, I don't think you're having flaws, Lori. It sounds to me like no. you're doing great. Thanks. It sounds to me like you're doing fantastically. Father. Child? Um, I know. Um, uh, I, I guess my favorite way to uh, work, my favorite situation is to be in workshop with a cast and a director, and to um, have uh, every day or every th other day to bring in pages, um, because I think because I was a performer before I was a writer, as soon as I hear words coming out of people's mouths, I can, I know so much more than I ever can when it's on paper, and so I really like to, um, 
when I'm in that situation to get up really, really early, like even though I'm a night person, to get up really early, like four or five o'clock in the morning, and then write for uh, a bunch of hours, and then send those pages to the stage manager, take a shower, go to rehearsal, and then um, work, uh, work those pages with actors and a director, and do the thing the next day, and that's my, my favorite, favorite way to work. I wish I had thought of that because that's actually my favorite part of the process is to be with other actors in the room, especially yeah. ones that I trust. Yeah. That yeah. you're or, or have are writing with them in mind. Mm -hmm. So and, and the workshop process is great because when you get into the workshop process, it that's all you're doing. You're not auditioning, you're not running around trying to do anything else. You're some place and you have two weeks and or three weeks and something has to happen and you're the motor. So the workshop Air, that process is fantastic. I mean, th you know, playwriting is, you're writing work that is, uh, it's a blueprint to create something alive on stage. And I think that that is a advantage uh, that people who were performers and became writers often have, that they know how dialogue, how action works on stage. They know what that is. And so this thing of writing on your feet in this way is, and I'm sure uh, m many of you do that as well. I mean, it's, it's tremendously productive and it is to the point, you know? It is exactly what we're trying to be doing. You know, um, Alan Akeburn's plays are the delights of theatrical action that they are because he has been writing on his company for years and he writes those plays and then they put them in front of an audience and they see them in the world, you know? There's no, that's what, that's what playwriting's for. Um, uh, and that's what it's about. And I think it's a very fortunate if you have that connection in you. I think it's very difficult for playwrights who m only have uh, uh, readings or only imagine hearing their work coming out of actors' mouths. If you have in you already, because you are an actor, because you work with actors, that connection, if that <coughs> connection is inherent in you, I mean, that's, that's a huge part of the deal. And, and um, writing solo, I, uh, if, you know, before I even get to the workshops, I go to people's houses and say, you know, I bring them a little bit of wine. I say, you got two hours. I, want to s I brought my music stand, and I'm going to uh, read this to you. And I do that just so I can start, keep going with it. And I do it periodically before I even get to the point of having a workshop. Because I, I hear it. Mm -hmm. And I'm standing also. I'm standing and trying to, you know, physicalize it, but um, it's very important to mm -hmm. hear it. That sounds like a fun evening. <laughs> I'll come over to my house. I, and if you're, if, you're ever in, if you're an actor and you're ever in a play um, where you're dressed as a clown at the end of scene two and then you have to be in a tuxedo at the top of scene three, then you, you kind of know that that playwright was never an actor. Um, <laughs> I'd like to open it up to the audience and give you all wow, give you all a chance to to ask questions. Um, do we have someone to use a microphone, or should I just uh, repeat questions? You have a microphone. Awesome. Yeah. As soon as it's on. Can you ask the well, you you could also ask the question, and I can repeat it so that. Hi. So I think that this is um, a continuation of what you've been talking about right now, but. I'm curious to know, um, presuming that we're never satisfied and just putting that aside, <laughs> what is your ideal amount of time to bring a work to a point where you would be as satisfied as a person can be? Meaning in, in months or years, like what is the development process that you think brings your work to a fruition you can be happy with? Happy enough to present it in, to a workshop situation, or happy enough no, to no, no, no. I, I mean, uh, you know, you say, okay, I'm moving on to the next project mm. because I feel that I have realized this project. Oh my God, that takes years. Yeah. Exactly, it takes me years know. because, for me, um, I talk it for a year and then I write it down and send it to my director, and then I get a workshop. Uh, for uh, uh, Sundance or the, the page of the stage at La Jolla is excellent. Ojai Playwrights Conference, excellent. And you get a workshop and you go away from that and then once you have the, the first workshop, you have a whole 
you can rewrite totally, total rewrite, and to, into another workshop, you know, another rewrite, and then I go to, say, Seattle, where they're used to seeing early work, and they're used to seeing the first version of the work, and they know it's the first version. It's not, you know, they know how to, how to even handle that. And after that, then you rewrite again. And, and now you're thinking, hmm, I guess I'll go and do that, that off-Broadway production. Um, and you are working in production every minute of every day. And even then, when you get to uh, the actual run of the show, you actually know you're not done. You know, you don't, I don't feel like I'm ever done, you know. Um, I just let it go at some point, you know. I then, I, I always end up doing it in LA, and after that, then I, I, I say, okay, that's that. But I get about three real productions before I think I've done it. There's each audience, each production is telling me something. I'm on stage, and I hate it when the director leaves and you have to like, it's frozen hmm. for that production, especially the first one. And you, and I'm, I'm up in Seattle doing a play limping, but I'm doing it because it's frozen for now. You know, I don't change lines or any blocking or anything until I have rewritten it and get it to the next pop part. But I live a long time with it limping. Wow. Yes, right here. If you, one second, if you could wait for the, thanks. Hi. Um, you talked a lot about the difficulty of like switching hats between being a writer and being a performer. I find that often when I'm writing, like, I'm, you know, you're writing and you're like in love with this character and you might not be writing for yourself, um, but how do, you, how do you navigate the space between creating a character that people can fall in love with and also giving the actors enough space to create something themselves? That's to all of you. Hmm. Just anybody who wants to answer. I'm just curious. Um, I mean, characters should be actable, I would think. But, um, but that doesn't mean that everybody is the right actor for it. So I think um, when you have you know, you have the experience of knowing that you've got the right person. And I think with every collaborator in the theater, the dream is when you have the thing in your head that's perfect, mm. and then the person does it, and it's not what you pictured. It's better than what you pictured. And it's the things you couldn't have pictured, and yet it is true. And um, then you start to write for that character, and then... Um, you know, once you start to write on an actor, you write on that actor. If you were writing on a different actor, things would go in a different way. Um, but that's part of the that's part of the collaboration. And what it means is that in you know, if you're lucky and you get a production that is exactly what you want, it means that subsequent productions will never, or it will be a long time before somebody will figure out how to make a production that feels as right as that one, because all the parts aren't going to fit in the same way. You're also writing into your set at a certain point. You know, you're writing timing um, based on, and, and also story based on um, what is seen and what is not seen. Um, theater is ephemeral. Um, but I think that's, I don't, I don't know if that answers your question or not. Yeah. Lori, what were you say? Well, I, I was about to say the same thing. I mean, I always have people in mind, not as I'm writing, I'm writing on people. And also, when I'm in the room with them in, a, in a, a workshop situation or even just discussing things with them, I, I never feel um, this, con I personally never feel this conflict of, of their contribution because I learn so much from them. And I don't know if it's, if it's that I have luck or it's, uh, it's, it is a relationship. It's a collaboration with, these, with, with the people that I work with. Um, so I, I don't have that struggle, but I think it is because they're there from the beginning. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing I would say is that sometimes you don't have the right actor. And sometimes the things that you want an actor to do, you've written a part that actually asks 
somebody to do some demanding things. And um, you know, in my plays a lot, I, I write action that is about the pr a progression of people thinking. And in my experience, um, American actors have a hard time doing that as a generalization. They write, the, they can play the progression of feelings, but thinking as a passionate, emotionally co connected action, that's something that British actors can do very well, and then there are some American actors who do it really well. So I have been told sometimes, this, this is too long, this is too boring, there's nothing happening, when I have known there is something happening, and the actors, even good actors who are looking at it, are not, they don't, uh, they can't see what that thing is, and you can hold out for the right actor, if you know that there's something there, and then when you have that right actor, then you might find out, oh, that part actually is a little boring, and then you have to change it, you know? But, um, and then the other thing I would say is that sometimes there's work that's based on a, a pace and a sound um, of dialogue, and the, and the life of it has to do with that, particular certain kind of character-y things, and it's not in the content of what's said, it's in the manner of speaking, and if you don't have an actor who can hear that rhythm in their head and convey that rhythm, again, people will, might say to you, this writing isn't working, mm. because you don't have the right match of actor to bring that m mechanism that's in your writing to, to, elute, to activate that. Mm. Um. Lisa and Lori, I appreciate both of you recognizing the messy, sometimes conflicted reality of navigating that wilderness of the blank page. Um, all of you talk about the usefulness of being in the moment of the rehearsal floor and of the workshop to see how your words are actable and what is happening and learning from that. You may all be talking about situations where you're commissioned for something, so you're not being precious with it, but I guess my question is, is there any sense in the timeline of this isn't ready to go in front of people, or is it, I don't have time to be that delicate. If it is on the page, I need to hear it out loud, and then I'll work out whatever I gotta work out. It's, for me, it's such a crucial aspect of the process that whether it's in a room or whether it's in a living room, I have to hear it. I have to hear it, whether it's a table read, whether it, I, it, I couldn't skip it. I couldn't skip that part of the process of having the words in people's mouths um, if I wanted to in terms of my process. I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I feel the same. And I, I think, you, you know, the, the, thing to try to do is to make those situations where the expectations of the people watching meet um, the place where you are. Um, but you, you, I mean, I think you're right. You can't, you can't be precious and make, you know, you, you have to just, I mean, I do. I, I have to just sort of let the mess be what it is. Right, and I guess I, was, I meant more, not that you would skip the workshop process, do you find yourself ever rewriting before you get it to people to read out loud? Or is it basically once you've gone through it and you know what you're aiming for, then it's time to hear it out loud? I'll How rewrite every happen? single second until somebody rips the pencil out of my yeah, hand. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. And I have somebody that, re that I, it, it happens to be my husband who's an actor and, and he kind of functions as my de facto dramaturg, but nothing goes even to my composers until he's seen it and says, he doesn't tell me it's good or bad, but he'll ask me questions and there's always, there's always a feedback portion for me. Yes, right here. Enviable position. Um, and, and advice for those of us who'd like to get that percentage expanded? For me, um, I acted in plays all over New York City for 16 years. Just, I worked in, in all these shows for 16 years, we were just, and may, had different theater homes, you know, the public and playwrights and MTC. I had these, I created these theater homes. So when I came to LA and, um, and you know, got the keys to the theater, 
I actually had uh, theaters that I could send it to because I had put down 16 years of groundwork. So that's how I, that's how I got in there because I, I did those musicals and I did, I would be doing, rehearsing a play in the day and doing the performance at night for 16 years. So they, you know, they read my plays. Anything to add? Um, I, it's the, oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say that artistic home for me was how I started writing for a specific theater. I was working at a theater that did all original work, um, a beautiful theater in Door County, Wisconsin that it's called Northern Sky Theater. Um, the guy who wrote Spitfire Girl, Fred Alley, originated that theater. And I said to Fred one day, would you write a woman's show? And he said, why don't you do it? And that's why I wrote my first play and why it got produced. Well, it was, a, it was written for that company. And that's where I discovered my joy of doing that. But I, I was part of this company, and it gave, I learned through this process that, that this was what I could do. But I think having an artistic home is an important place to start. And I also think supporting other people's work. Mm -hmm. You cannot ask people to support your work if you do not go see their plays, go to their readings, offer constructive feedback. Mm. Do not tell them how to fix their play, but ask them questions that they might want to hear. You have to be there for other people. It's only through serving other people that you can ask people to do that for you. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons I'm proud to be a, a rep. I'll just say a plug for that. Um, it's a joy to serve other people. So. I think we have time for one more. And I see you have a microphone, so make it good. Your honesty, your vividness has just been wonderful. And um, I think a lot of us are writing from things that are emerging in our own life. Um, our, we, our lives grow, we change, and so on, but we're expressing something that's happening at a certain time in our lives, and it may feel very vulnerable to express it or do those first readings in someone's living room. How do you handle that vulnerability and the what's me and what's a character and you know, people's reaction to early work and vulnerable work? I don't but make a judgment on it. I, if I could keep them awake, sometimes they fall asleep when I'm at, you know, I've, then they say, oh, it's the wine, you know? <laughs> but I mean, I don't care. I just have to have them listening and I need to hear it for myself and I'm in the moment, you know? And when they fall asleep, it lets me know, uh-huh, <laughs> there's something wrong here, you know? But I, I, I'm, I'm watching them too. Everything means something and I have a thick skin. You know, I have a thick skin. I have been in shows. I mean, you know, when you're working in the theater, you just, you know, you all know you have a thick skin. I don't make any judgment on it at all. It's not supposed to be judged at that point. I'm just working on it. I'm in process. I don't even feel vulnerable. If they don't like it, mm. <laughs> You know, and if they say, oh, it was wonderful, okay, all right, but you know what, I don't believe that either. You know, well, a lot of times we do a show and people come back, you know, it was your worst show. Oh, that was fabulous. Thank you. <laughs> you know, but I think this is not a business for, you know, that vulnerability for me. It just holds me back. I, I always say I can never get a good job when I'm Alfred and Dorothy Woodard's daughter. But when I become the, the person that has been created from all these years of working in the theater, I can get a job. I think that what Charlene says is a very key. It's a, it's, it's a key answer to your question. Um, years ago, I heard somebody say, they were asked the question, what's the difference between autobiographical solo performance and therapy? <laughs> and their response was, therapy is for you. An autobiographical solo performance, theoretically, is for the audience. Uh -huh. And I think that what, um, what uh, if I'm interpreting correctly, Charlene was expressing is that, um, I mean, I wrote, I wrote shows that drew on things from my family, but I created a character of myself and used that material to make a piece of theater hmm. in which something would happen for the audience. Um, and if you are trying, if what you are doing is really, you know, performance art sometimes ha happens in real time and there's not that artifice. But theater 
is always created from artifice. And for me, taking things that happen in my real life and, and turning them into theater, I was focused, as Charlene, Charlene was just describing, on the craft of doing that in, in a way that would connect with the audience. And I don't have quite as thick a skin as Charlene does, but I will say that I never felt like it was, like those stories I was telling, that I was vulnerable inside of those stories. Those stories had, by the time they made it to the stage, they had happened a long time ago, and they had been converted for the purposes of that show. Mm -hmm. I mean, then I had my own private, I had my own private life, which is actually not what I put in, on stage. Mm -hmm. But I used that material, and then I worked it with my craft to make something. So, so, when, so when I'm telling these stories about being lost in Auschwitz, and the audience is feeling that I'm reliving that, what I'm thinking is, I'm, I'm you know, inside a performance conveying making, you know, Mark Brokaw, when he was directing that show, said to me, you don't have to feel it, you have to make the audience feel it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I would be doing. Mm -hmm. So that's how you, I mean, that's just a natural, mm -hmm. it's, that's what your focus is. That makes you, you, your person, your personal stories are yours. You should keep them yours. If you want to use them to make theater, then do that. But you shouldn't probably, I, I wouldn't make myself vulnerable mm -hmm. by throwing my, my essential self on stage, although I would try to make something essential and true theatrically for an audience, but it's a different thing. And, and you know that acting, in acting they always say, if you're gonna use an experience, try to get something seven years ago or more, <laughs> so that you can have the objectivity and you can see it in a certain way, so that you're not really just having this major moment on stage, it's happening right now, my father died last week. You, you know, you, you, you're using something that you have some distance on. Thank you. Hey everyone, thank you so much for coming and have fun tonight. Thank you, thank you everybody.